this chapter will be pretty short compared to previous chapter. So we will have a short meeting also. Mm. This chapter talks about different, different kinds of values, well, different types of values because it's dynamically typed language. We will hey, we will have a single single variable that can hold different kind like booleans, numbers, or strings at different times. Now everything is a number, but then at the end of the chapter, we will have a framework to support more than one types and we will add booleans and new. It's an interesting comment that besides statically typed and dynamically typed, there was also a category of programming language which only has one type. So it's unit types, so-called. And yeah, I think in the area of BCPL, they use like word type. But, and as of this moment, our interpreter also has only one type, but we will add more. So the representation we will use is tagged union. which depends on programming languages will also be called something like variant or some type or enum. So here is a question in the comment about why unit type is no longer popular. It's just very limited. You only have one type of things you can use. You always operate the machine word and then what if you have something with two words, you need two variables basically. So it's very limited. So the tag, tag union means we need to have a tag, though we define the C enum as a tag. And then we we since we need to hold different kind of variant for our tag enum, we can like put put data in this way where just it's a struct with each each field be one of the possibility, but that's wasteful. So instead we will use a union. And that's how, that's why we use this tagged union representation. We have a tag and a union. 
And I, I like this convention of calling this S because I, I used to call those kind of thing like value and then when or data, but then it's become weird when I actually use it. it become, I often have value dot value dot something. So I like this convention. And yeah, here is a comment that someone else, someone else told him about using S as the name of the union field. And a uh, typical 64-bit machine have a value look like this because, because we have a double, which is eight byte aligned. We are forced to add some padding. That also means our tag need to waste eight byte. Even, even if we make it smaller, it doesn't matter. And also here's a comment about, we could move the tag after the union, then this structure itself will become smaller. But then if we make an array of such struct, it still need to be aligned. So it doesn't help either. And so here's a comment, our values are 16 bytes which seems to be large and, but it's will do for now until there's a optimization chapter at the end where uh, it talks about name boxing where we will optimize this. There are also a solution called pointer, uh, pointer tagging, which is similar. And also 60 bytes is still smaller. Uh, it's still small enough we can just put them in the stack and pass them around by value. And everything in logs is immutable by now. The semantics is kind of like, for example, Python where every number is immutable when we, when we change some number, we, we don't change the variable directly. Instead, what we do is just calculate another number value and rebind. At least the semantic is like that. So then we add a bunch of macros. This this is kind of like constructor where those macros create specific types of value from a C value. Just just it's a bit of syntactic convenience. And those one just retrieve the value from. Another comment that the 16-bit value can be held in the single vector register. Yeah, true. I never checked those kind of things, but maybe.
but most operation we do to them are still scalar operations. So I don't know what will happen in this case. Not really familiar with CMD stuff. Mm. Also, those values, uh, those macros are not type safe because our C enum is not type safe. And we can actually check, but those macros don't check. So if we do something like this, it will happily just do undefined behavior, basically. And we add a bunch of macros to check, but we don't enforce that with those S macros. But yeah, now we have enough infrastructure to convert between logs value and C values. So now we need to deal with constant. We basically emit constant will emit a value in this case. And if we have, in this case, we have a numerical constant and it needs to be wrapped in a value. And when we print a value, we basically need to unwrap it but I, we will revisit this function when we add more kind of values. And next is unary negation and uh, we need to enforce that the negation is on a number because if it is on something like Boolean, then we need to handle the runtime error. We don't want our interpreter to stuck in this case we need to handle it gracefully. So we have something like this. Where if the if the, the top of the stack is a the number, then we continue to our stuff. Otherwise we have a runtime error. But in this case, we just report the error and then quit the interpreter. Yeah, otherwise we negate. We need to pop the value and unwrap it into a number, negate it and then wrap it back into a value and then push it into the stack. And here's a function called peak, which we basically use to access the stack, which I guess, but it's not necessarily top. In here is top, but we can 
use this function to get arbitrary position on the stack. Yeah, and here's a comment. Why not just pop the operand and then validate it, which is more like how we use stack instead of look at arbitrary position. However, in later chapters, it become important to leave operand on the stack to so the garbage collector can find them. And it's the reporting runtime error because it's C. We don't have a sophisticated formatting library, and we have this sister, sister variadic, and we use uh, f print f and. And this is basically how to do C-style variadic. And as a result, we can call this function just like calling printf, but it will print into the standard opt. And for uh, variadics, we need the start arc header. Next, next we commented, there are a bunch of binary arithmetic operators. They all look the, look the same. So we use a macro. And this macro, because we, it's, a few chapter ago when we just have numbers, it seems overkill, but now, now we have a lot more complicated stuff in it, like like tracking and emit error and then doing those conversions. So now, now if we copy that four times, it become a bit unwieldy. So No, I guess another option is to write a function and then ask compiler to force inline it. And yeah, we have this. And then we will add other literals like true and false and new. Here is also a comment that using dedicated operation for certain constant value in the VMs is beneficial because VMs spend much of time just executing the instructions. It's not even executing, reading, just basically fetching and decoding instructions. So simple instructions like the JVM, you can have yeah, have simple instructions for 
like some floating point values like zero, one, two, and integer values from negative one to five. Even though this end up not being used for anymore because most GVMs now JIT to machine code. But we are not doing that. So we can't do this kind of optimizations in our interpreter if we want. But First, we just add, add three operations for our three new kind of values, new kind of literals, true, false, and new. And we need to update our table for tokens. Where true, false, and new, basically it's, we need to parse them as literal so we can use this parse literal function. And that's it. Then in here, we in the literal function, we basically check, we basically check what's the type of the token and then emit the corresponding uh, operation. And for the interpreter part, it's also where we have those operation, we just push the corresponding value to the top of the stack. Uh, and also, this is a pretty printer of the dis our disassembler. We also it's easy because those simple instruction we just call this simple instruction function. And with all of those in place, we can write program like this: true or false or new. And then it says the interpreter also can't print the result. So, because currently it can only print numbers and we will have undefined behavior again. And yeah, we need to, we need to use a switch statement in this case. A nice thing about using this Swiss statement approach is that the compiler will warn you if you miss any cases, at least with the, with the like enough warning enabled. So we also add a logical operators. First, we will add logical not, which is a prefix operator. We will add a new instruction not, have a unary parsing function, which already parse unary negation. We will just use that to also parse not. And again, we will do a switch statement on token if it's if it's banned, then we know it's like this. Or if it's minus, then we emit the negate. Otherwise, it's unreachable. But I guess if you have a bug in the parser, then you can reach there. So I guess a better error handling is preferable than just doing, just silently ignore that.
And when you in the interpreter, in the VM, sorry, we need to do the same kind of dance where we need to pop the value and wrap it, wrap it back. Um, pop the, we need to pop the value, negate that, and then wrap it back. The, this is falsy, is kind of weird because our locked language has the concept of falsy values where certain kind of values are considered false. In our case, we we have Boolean false, but we also have nil. And our our negation also also need to handle nil. So not nil will get our get us choose, which is weird. Comment in C++, I did this by overloading implicit casting. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we can do an implicit conversion to the Boolean. The comment is that more or less scheduled than macros. Yeah, maybe. But also, also this kind of falsy value thing is very common in dynamically typed languages in in Ruby, in Python, in JavaScript. Yeah, I feel I feel like it's I feel like it's too much, especially for negation. I feel that on specific spots this may be useful. For example, condition of if, but for negation, why do we want to negate other things? Oh, sorry, not negation for the unary not. Why we want to not for a nil, for example, and the language semantics shouldn't be like that. So there are also end and all, but those need to be short circuited. And we don't have infrastructure for that yet. So instead, we start to deal with comparisons like equal, or greater, or less. So there are not not equal, less than, or greater than, but but we can we can just combine those and not to have the same effect. We can also add those instructions if we want our VM to be faster, or if we want to have a minimum set of instructions, we can even get rid of the greater. 
it will still work. Like a lot of C++ algorithms only use equal and less because uh, for generic algorithms, we don't know how much a type implement. Here is also an interesting comment about NAN, which will mess up if we do this kind of disugaring. And in a real programming language, we need to be careful because the semantic is different. But in here, it doesn't matter that much. We're just creating a toy, basically. And we will add up, we will put a bunch of new tokens into the binary slot. And inside the binary, We just init emit bytes, but for for those we don't have an instruction, we need to emit two inst uh, two instructions to achieve the same effect. And for equality, for equality, we don't need to do type track. Everything can do equality, at least in our language. Everything can track equality with other thing. And if their type doesn't match, then they are not equal. That's it. So we have this helper function. If their type not match, they are not equal. If their type match, then we switch on type and then unwrap it and check whether the value is equal. Here is also a comment that some language has implicit conversions where value of different types may be considered equal. For example, in JavaScript, the number zero is equivalent to string zero. Which is which becomes so much pain that JS added a strict equality operator later. And yeah, PHP also have these kind of things. Mm. And then most dynamically typed language with separate integer and floating point number types will do implicit conversion between numbers. <laughs> I feel like this is a very perfect analogy that you spend more time on it, it makes less sense. <laughs>
also here is uh, his comment out of about mem compare. People code it in C or C++ probably already know this where, because mem compare then we have paddings. And the padding of a union can be garbage, and we don't want to compare those garbage. For greater and less in the VM, we also call this macro binary operator. That's it. The mac macro also do type checking, but we, are, we already have the infrastructure of doing that. And our disassembler needs to be updated. Our value printer is already updated and we can do something like this now. So instead of a calculator, we can do something not number in our interpreter. And we will have a new building type strings. But strings are more complicated because it, they can vary in size. So they need to be dynamically allocated. We need another interaction. And that's why we have an, another chapter for that. Yeah, we are done. This is a short chapter. <laughs>